regaining language was a matter of deliberate education on the part of the younger generation at the time. The influence of my deliberate schooling by the style of the Stefan George Kreis can still be discerned by any stylist who cares to pay attention to such matters. In my first books on America and especially on the Geistesgeschichte der Rassenidee, regaining language meant recovering the subject matter to be expressed by language. And that meant to get out of what today one would call the false consciousness of the petty bourgeoisie whose literary representatives dominated the scene. Hence, this regaining of language is part of the resistance against the ideologies, which also destroy language, because the ideological thinker has lost contact with the reality and finds the symbols for expressing not reality, but his state of lostness in relation to reality. To penetrate this phony language and to restore reality through the restoration of language was the work of Karl Kraut as much as of Stefan George and his friends at the time. In particular, influential in the work of Karl Kraus was his great drama of the First World War, Die Letzten Tage der Menschheit. His superb sensitiveness to the melody and vocabulary of phoniness in politics, war patriotism, denigration of enemies, ochlopratic name-calling, and so on. This critical work of Karl Kraus, with its first climax in Die Letzten Tage der Menschheit, was continued throughout the 1920s in his criticism of the literary and press language of the Weimar Republic in Austria and in Germany. It increased in importance with the gradual emergence uh, of National Socialism to dominance on the public scene. The second great work dealing with the major catastrophes of the 20th century was his Dritte Walpurgisnacht, dealing with the phenomenon of Hitler and National Socialism. A restrained version of this work was published in his last year. The restraints were due to his fear that the full exposition of the Swinish catastrophe could hurt people who were potential victims of the man in power. The full text of the Dritte Walpurgisnacht was published only after the war by the Kösel Verlag in Munich as volume one of the edition of the collected works which run into 16 volumes. I should say that a serious study of National Socialism is still impossible without recourse to the Dritte Walpurgisnacht and to the years of criticism in the Fackel because here the intellectual morass that must be understood as the background against which a Hitler could rise to power becomes visible. The phenomenon of Hitler is not exhausted by his person, the adherents he more immediately found and his successors, but by the destruction of society in which personalities, who otherwise would be grotesque marginal figures, come to public power because they superbly represent the public that admires them. This internal destruction of the society is not finished with the Allied victory over the German armies in the Second World War, but still goes on. I should say that the contemporary destruction of German intellectual life, and especially the destruction of the universities, is still the aftermath of the destruction that brought Hitler to power and of the destruction worked under his regime. There is yet no end in sight as far as the disintegration of society is concerned, which may produce, again, surprising results. The study of this period, and especially its astute analysis in the dirty detail, 
that part of it that Hannah Arendt has called the banality of evil is still of the greatest importance because the parallel phenomena are to be found in our Western society, so fortunately yet not with the destructive effects which led to the German catastrophe. I shall now go into the question of more immediate studies as a student in the university and my veering toward the pure theory of law of Kelsen. It is not possible to determine in detail why Kelsen proved the more strongly attractive teacher than Spann. The range of Spann was without a doubt much larger philosophically and historically than the range of Kelsen's work. What attracted me, as far as I recollect, was the precision of the analytical work, which is peculiar to a great lawyer. In the success at the time of Kelsen's pure theory of law and its continuing importance in philosophy of law, it is sometimes forgotten that Kelsen was a practical lawyer who devised the Austrian Constitution of 1920, and his commentary on this Constitution is perhaps the work that shows his juridical acumen to its greatest advantage. What I learned from Kelsen, I should say, is the conscientious and the responsible analysis of texts, as it was practiced in his own multi-voluminous work and in the discussions in the seminar. This work was inseparable, of course, from the pure theory of law itself, which furnished a logical analysis of a legal system. This analysis of the system, culminating in Kelsen's conception of the Grundnorm, stands still today. It has been improved in numerous details, as for instance by the elaboration of the Delegationszusammenhang of Merkel and by the expansion of the system beyond the constitutional Grundnorm to the fundamental norm of international law through Ferdos, there have been further refinement in the studies of the younger men like Felix Kaufmann, Fritz Schreier and Emanuel Winternitz. But on the whole, the Kelsen analysis was complete and could be improved only in this or that detail. This fact explains why there has been no great further development of the pure theory of law. It was a splendid achievement of a brilliant analyst and it was so good that it barely could be improved upon. What Kelsen did in this respect still stands as the core of any analytical theory of law and I have later used this core with some improvements of my own in my courses in jurisprudence which I gave at Louisiana State University. I should like to stress that there never has been a difference of opinion between Kelsen and myself regarding the fundamental validity of the pure theory of law. The differences with Kelsen's theory began to evolve gradually. That I was not a simple adherent can be gathered from the fact that I made my own PhD with both Spann and Kelsen as sponsors, a feat greatly admired by the younger people at the time because the universalism of Spann and the neo-Kantianism of Kelsen were considered to be incompatible. The differences evolved from ideological components in the pure theory of law, which are superimposed on the logic of the legal system proper, but do not affect its validity. They can be removed while leaving the core of the theory intact. This ideology superimposed was the neo-Kantian methodology, which determines the field of science by the method used. In this case, by the logic of the legal system. Since, due to the conventional vocabulary of the time, Staatslehre was the name of the field which Kelsen represented as a professor, and the Neocantian methodology 
circumscribed by its method, the field of the logic of the legal system, the Staatslehre had to become the Rechtslehre. And everything that went beyond the Rechtslehre was then, by the semantic identification, no longer a part of the Staatslehre. That, of course, was an untenable position. At the time, of course, I did not have the full understanding of the rather primitive semantic games involved in such misconstruction, but I sensed it through the appeal from the materials. It was obviously impossible to deal with the problems of the Staat or of politics at large and omit everything except the logic of legal norms. So, hence, my difference from Kelsen developed through my interest in the materials of a political science which had been excluded from the Staatslehre understood as Rechtslehre. Rather early, already in 1924, I published my first essay, comma of rather dubious scientific quality, entitled Reine Rechtslehre und Staatslehre, in which I confronted the Reine Rechtslehre with the materials dealt with by the earlier German Staatslehre in the early 19th century. I conceived already at that time the task of a political scientist as that of a reconstruction of a political science after its restriction to the core of the normal logic. That requires a few remarks about the problem of Neo-Kantianism as it presented itself to myself as a student in the 1920s. There were several Neo-Kantian schools. The one that was dominant in the person of Kelsen was the so-called Marburger Schule of Cohen. Cohen, in his interpretation of the critique of pure reason, rather concentrated on the constitution of science by the categories of time, space and substance. Science to be understood as the Newtonian physics as understood by Kant. This pattern of constituting a science through the categories applied to a body of materials was the model for the constructing the pure theory of law. Everything that would not fit into the categories of norm logic could no longer be considered science. There were, however, other Neo-Kantian schools. Above all, the so-called Southwest German school represented by Windelband and Rickert, who dealt with the constitution of the subject matter of historical sciences by the, in quotation marks, values. That is a branch of methodology which goes back to, I believe, the 1870s, when the Tatsachenwissenschaften, sciences of facts, were for the first time confronted under that name by the Wertwissenschaften, by Ritschl, the Protestant theologian. The problem in its formulation had its obvious origin in the beginning dominance of the natural sciences as a model of science, and against such prestige dominance, poor fellows like theologians, historians, and in incipient social scientists had to find out what made their science a science after all. That is how the values were invented. The values were, in the conception of Rickett, certain cultural forces about whose reality nobody could have any reasonable doubt, such as the state, art, religion, and so forth. And materials would then be selected and constituted in their selection sciences of a philosophy of art and of art history, of history at large under the aspect of pragmatic politics with the Staat as the value, and so forth. 